you fair. should be live, yes. Hello, welcome. <laughs> uh, I'm Mark Davenport, and I'm with Heidi Hernlein. Mm -hmm. And we have created the Wisdom Factory Forum for people who have experience, wisdom, and knowledge to share with the world. I'm Mark Davenport. Oh, oh excuse me, thing goes wrong. Well, that's not what we intended. No, we hear ourselves again. So we have to switch that on. Oh, excuse me, thing goes wrong. that's not what we intended. <laughs> okay, now we should be here somewhere. Are you here? I hear is Martin you. here? Martin, you are here. So this is good. So you continue to speak and we will find the window. Here is the window. All right. <laughs> we'll try again. Yes. Okay. Again, this is this is Mark Davenport. Again, I'm here with Heidi Hernline. <laughs> and we have created the Wisdom Factory uh, for people who uh, have experience, knowledge, and wisdom they want to share with the world. Uh, we've been doing these Wisdom Factory broadcasts for over a year now, and uh, you can join that us, us at uh, bit.ly dot wf community. All right. This is the community. Here we go. Uh, okay. okay. All right. We're out. We're coaches. We should say that today everything goes wrong and excuse us. I'm still writing a, an email to all the subscribers <laughs> on Webinar Jam because there was just no start button for the broadcast. So we quickly created mm -hmm. another uh, event now directly on the Wisdom Factory as a Google Hangout. Mm -hmm. So you won't have the possibility, unfortunately, to ask questions. But you can join us afterwards on Blab. Yes, indeed. And then mm -hmm. we can talk about yeah. everything. I'm still writing a letter to mm -hmm. all the subscribers. Excuse me, so all you right. go on. <laughs> well, I'm doing the easy part, just the talking here. <laughs> I should say that Heidi and I are coaches and counselors, and we're presently preparing a, a Relationships for the Second Half of Life series. Uh, our previous series were the Wisdom Factories, and there are replays available at, do we have an ad? Uh, replays, replays available are uh, here. There we go. At bit.ly slash Wisdom Factory videos. Okay. <laughs> but today we are beginning a 12-part series about wisdom in relationships that we're calling Stop the Relationship, Grow Your Relations. And we have 14 experts operating from an integral worldview, um, <clears throat> beginning with our guest today, Martin Utsik. He has written... Uh, the, oh, hell, he's, he's reading. He he's, doesn't know it by heart. Yeah. Integral relationships. You know this. Oh, of course, I've said it dozens of times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not nervous. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, integral relationships. Yes, is which was a big, big, groundbreaking work that came out. I think in 2010 and was acknowledged by all kinds of people, including Ken Wilber, the founder and creator of uh, Integral Theory. And he called it a terrific book. And it was uh, lo loaded by other Integral people too, as, as well as others. Uh, but today, <clears throat> we're gonna be talking about falling in love with someone good for you avoiding the basic mistakes when entering into an intimate relationship. And so um, we now can turn this over to Martin, who may want to introduce himself further and maybe correct the errors that I <laughs> hurriedly made along the way. Come in, Martin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. You can see me? Yes. Oh, thanks. Uh, Heidi and Mark for having me on your show and being the the first guest on this wonderful lineup with some of my good friends like Keith Witt and Catherine Rupert Thomas and Jeff Salzman and others. Mm -hmm. so it's quite an honor. And 
you said everything right. Uh, the book is, <laughs> my book is called Integral Relationships. I said it right so much. I'll stop now then. Okay. It, it, it has a, a subtitle called The Manual for Men. Yeah. Yes. So women are not allowed to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. The so, cat's out of the bag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, well, our topic today is, as you already said, falling in love with someone good for you. And I, I thought I, I first clear up a few things around this falling in love uh, term, the first part, mm -hmm. and then with uh, someone good for you as the second part. You know what? I'm going to interrupt you at this moment because when we were publicizing the show uh, in the past few days, we got a very interesting comment from uh, 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 someone in Google Plus who mm -hmm. we know. Uh, his name is Vivek, which is short for a long Indian name. <laughs> I can't really pronounce Vivekananda Bandhu Rao. <laughs> he said to me, the sentence suggests that falling in love is a planned thing, which then becomes planned love, which is so yuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says, falling in love is falling in love. If one falls in love, then everything else becomes irrelevant. The only hope one can have is that the other person falls in love with this person as well. Mm -hmm. If that happens, it would be heaven on earth. Yeah. So well, I think a lot or of hell. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe oh, he's, he's, ab he's absolutely right, of course. Falling in love is uh, a gift, you know, from God, or we fall in love by grace. Yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily a choice, even though I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. So the integral, as most of the listeners and viewers probably know, is all about making distinctions, right? Mm -hmm. We're not just calling all dogs dogs. We say there's poodles and there's ducks and there's German shepherds and so on and so forth. So when we say falling in love, uh, I, I may want to point out that these three make three distinctions. And, and the one is that, that, that we feel when, when we meet someone who meets what I call our primary fantasy. So like the, the, you know, where we're physically attracted and our body through a release of hormones indicates to us, this is a good person to make babies with, right? From an evolutionary perspective. And, and that is, I would say, mostly or totally uh, a hormonal reaction that, that creates hormones in our brain that, that, that allow us to put most of consider other considerations out of the making babies, healthy yes. babies together uh, aside. And that, of course, has uh, an evolutionary purpose. Without that, we wouldn't be here. None of us would mm -hmm. be here if our forefathers wouldn't have responded to this urge to procreate with certain types, you know, males who have certain qualities, mainly to be able to protect and provide, and females who have certain body features that indicate that they can bear healthy babies. We now know, for example, that women who have a hip to waist ratio of 0.8, you know, give birth to healthier babies than women who don't have these features or women who have smooth skin and well-aligned teeth and so on and so forth. So, so actually what we idealize as a, you know, now, nowadays as a beautiful woman, when researchers look at, at the health of the babies that they, they give birth to, what we idealize as a beautiful woman is also somebody who usually gives birth to a to or it's a higher chance to give birth to a healthy baby so mm -hmm. so this is this first urge of of you know what what we call infatuation i would say you know yeah. and then we call it love because we we long for this person and want to unite with this person also in a physical sexual sense the second type of love that that i think we we have indicated is is a love where uh, we feel sort of like a psychological connection with that person. And, and many love songs think, sing about that when, when they say, if you leave me now, you take away the biggest part of me. Or when I found you, there was no more emptiness inside. So they, they all point to this where somebody 
completes us in a, in a psychological sense. And that, of course, we do not find out by simply seeing that person and say, oh, he's tall or she has the, the perfect body. We need to interact with this person and talk with this person and be in, in that person's presence. And psychologists generally say if somebody had similar childhood experiences, and of course we all have been somewhat not loved in the ideal way that 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 we may have hoped for by our parents so we're all i don't want to say traumatized but obviously we all have some childhood wounds mommy daddy issues and when we meet somebody who had similar experiences but developed different coping mechanisms mm -hmm. that creates some some kind of psychological attraction, which I sometimes call mutual compatible pathology, right? Because <laughs> there is some, you know, uh, we soon then then realize that that things that we have repressed, that, that our partner has developed a different coping mechanism and, and responds differently to, we may find initially attractive, but then after a while, we find it problematic. And there is a good strategy uh, for that, to turn sort of like blame and, and rejection and don't do that into curiosity. So, so that, that would be the second factor. And of course, if these two factors come together, sexual attraction and psychological you know, compatibility, then we experience uh, you know, maybe a deeper love and, and a more, you know, a deeper bond with that person that goes beyond the pure physical and sexual. And then there is a, a third kind of love that, that very often then turns also into the kind of infatuation and, and sexual attraction is when, when we basically develop a relationship out of a friendship. We, we now know today that, that only about 9% of couples fall in love at first sight or very quickly, like Ken Wilber and Treya did, for example, if you read Grace and Grit. Most people know each other over a longer period of time. There's this German song, Tausend Mal berührt, Tausend Mal in nichts passiert. We touched each other a thousand times and a thousand times nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> and, and I know, yeah, <laughs> that was, yeah. so, so, so we know that, that people, uh, at least in the past, used to meet, you know, at the workplace and they worked there maybe for a year or two and, and interacted with another person or at a church or a university or in some other context. And they, you know, met with each other in different contexts many, many times over a longer period of time. And then all of a sudden, you know, some out of, of maybe disharmony or, or kind of liking each other, becoming friends, a love develops. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so which, these are distinctions I, I would I would make, and mm -hmm. and of course today in our over romanticized world, right? We expect when we meet our soulmate, or if you're single and looking for someone, that the sparks are flying, like you know, ideally on the first date, mm -hmm. or on the second or third date, and and so we're looking for that for that kind of spark, which which our friend in India kind of you know called. Like, you know, when we fall in love, we fall in love. It's, it's, it's just happening. And if it happens for the other person, it's, it's uh, as well, then, then it's like heaven. But uh, I would also maintain that it can be, it can turn into hell if, if the, the love is only hormonally uh, induced, mm -hmm. right? And then after a while, when the hormones wear off, then we get to know the real person. And there are good chances that, that this person is, in, you know, fairly incompatible with us in, in many other areas. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, most of us probably have had the experience of falling in love, and nearly as many have had the experience of that love ending. You know, yep. this despite the the lovely foretaste that we get, mm -hmm. and uh, this, of course, is is. is is very upsetting with that state of being for, for the people involved, or at least for one of them, maybe not for both. Yeah, yeah. But uh, what, uh, what's gone on? What happens to make that happen? How come that we fall out of love? What is that all about? 
Well, it, it depends on what of the three kinds of love we're talking about. Yeah. So, so obviously the hormones wear off and uh, that has evolutionary reasons. If, you know, throughout human history, if, if a couple fell in love and no babies were the result of their union, then it made total evolutionary sense that they would go and look for somebody else. Henry VIII. <laughs> Pardon? Henry VIII. <laughs> King Henry VIII. Yeah. yeah. Um, the psychological love, I think, you know, holds a lot of possibilities for healing and growth if we develop curiosity and do introspection and, and, and work, you know, own our emotional reactions to our partner's realities instead of blaming the partner. If we don't get over this hurdle and it just goes into a blame game, then obviously the, the relationship falls apart. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have a friendship and, and you know common interests and, and obviously from an integral perspective are somewhat similarly developed in, in important developmental lines, then also there are conflicts that, that cannot even resolve, be resolved through uh, com better communication or, or couples therapy and things like that. Yeah, and this is exactly, I'm coming now in, um, I have tried to, to overcome the technical challenges, mm -hmm. challenges, challenges, because I'm the tech guy here, mm -hmm. and I've put up our lower third, I'm sorry, uh, this is this one, if you want to support us, www.patreon.com slash Heidi63, in, in all this nervous system i couldn't find anything else but i wanted to have this uh, website up yeah and while we are talking uh, martin if you succeed to put your name up again i did uh, oh, I, you didn't put it on anyway so it is, it is you know, on it says I, I don't see it so no. oh well uh, okay. It okay. would be nice to have your name tag uh, there yeah, yeah. So, and but your website. The website, by the way, is one of the websites is this one, singles2couples.org, yeah, where you can find uh, Martin. That's mm -hmm. my old website, yes. But there is a link to the new one. So Okay, okay. good. Right. So, you know, um, I didn't, I listened only with half a ear, but just as well. <laughs> <laughs> Mark it talked about this comment of Vivek and he mm -hmm. said only falling in love is just, you know, you cannot really choose. And I was uh, answering that there are some factors that you can really be attentive to. And you were just uh, saying it when we are coming from what we call different levels of development. You can do whatever you want, but it's like uh, one person speaks English and the other one Chinese, mm. and they don't really understand each other. It depends on on the values. No? Would you like to talk a little bit on, on that? Yes, yes. Uh, I just want to reiterate that, that the more the more conscious you become, the more choice you have. And I mean, falling in love is in, in, in the pure hormonal sense, uh, you know, in a way like a little bit like being very hungry, you know, and, and craving food and sugar and fat, right? Which is also a deep evolutionary impulse. And some people are most, you know, some people in the Western world have learned to not always follow these impulses. And the same is true with if you get very attracted to a person and the hormones get released and, and you know you think about this person all the time, you know we 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 can choose that there's something di the difference between falling in love and entering into a relationship, right? Some people cannot help when they fall in love also to more or less blindly enter into a relationship, and other people are conscious enough to use their their mind and their you know, maybe their heart to to then determine is this really a person um, that I am good for and who is good for me. So I I, I, I want to stress the second part of what we said. You know, falling in love with somebody good for you. I think it's even more important to have enough self knowledge to know if you are good for your potential partner. Mm -hmm. It's not only a one way street that you determine if if she or he is good for you but even more importantly the other way around so how do you do that well uh, we integral people of course <laughs> use the integral lens oh. <laughs> <laughs> to, or would use the integral lens at least to 
you know, make some some educated uh, decisions or at least enter into a into a communication, a conversation with that person. Um, and if we are I, not integral people, I'm sure that not many people in the audience, or at least some don't know what integral is and yeah. what you are saying. But can you explain what integral people would do? <laughs> <laughs> then we'll see if we are. <laughs> That's of always always that uh, the tough question, uh, and and in the short amount of time you know that that we have, not so easy to explain. But but I thought I would, um, you know, I give three pr parameters, um, which which I call or which are called intimacy. So that's when you talk and the other person reveals about their thoughts and their feelings, you know, the level that they can reveal about their interiority, then it's it's like a triangle. I don't know if you can see me, it's like triangles. So on one side, you have intimacy. On the other side of the triangle, you have passion. And passion is includes sexual passion, but also includes passion for life or passion for living your purpose, right? Just being passionate about being a passionate person and be clear about what your passions are. And passions are different than interests, right? So interest is I like to play golf and dance and cook. A passion is sort of like what, what do you contribute to, to humanity or what is your purpose in life? And then at the bottom of the triangle, you have commitment. So how committed are you to, to live a passionate life and to be intimate? And now if, you, if we look at stages, in this context, it might be helpful just to, to look at, at six different levels that if you're familiar with the chakras, they're somewhat similar to the chakras. Mm -hmm. But we could start at, at the base level if you look maybe look at it like a house, like the, the foundation of the relationship would be all material things. You know, where do you live? What is your lifestyle? What is your income? Uh, what is your work? What are your your preferences in, in the material world. And then, you know, asking questions around that or having a communication around that, you know, to see what does each person reveal about this and maybe also ask, you know, why did you choose this job? Why do you live in this house? You know, why do you choose to live there, etc.? And and see how much commitment is there to this life. You know, is a person very attached to to their work and, and their you know their lifestyle or are they flexible? And, and how passionate are they about, about that? So, so that would be one level. And unfortunately, a lot of people may even stop, you know, comparing notes or, or having a conversation with their partner uh, only on that first basic level. On, this, on the second level, that would include, it's still somewhat material, uh, would, would include the physical body. You know, what do you eat? How do you exercise? And also about your sexuality. Obviously, sexual orientation, sexual practices, blocks, psychological blocks to your sexuality, and so on and so forth. You know, and, and how healthy. I often think about Passionate Marriage by David Schnark. is sort of like the book around where he says our biggest sex organ is the brain, right? Because if people have sexual blocks, that's very often related to their psychology and, and to their psychological well-being. And again, how much sexual intimacy can somebody have? How, how passionate can they be uh, in their sexual expression? And how committed can they be? You know, do, can they be monogamous or do they want to be monogamous? Polyamorous, open relationship. There's many different forms of, of expressing you know, your sexuality. And well, that's probably pretty obvious. Yeah. On a third level, you know, we called it a power, uh, you know, power, how do you express your power in the relationship? Are you rather a submissive person or a powerful person? How do you deal with conflicts that arise around power? Um, you know, who, who basically, how do you, how do you engage in the decision-making process? So that's that's more an energetic thing. You know, are you an introvert, an extrovert? Do you feel you get along better, you know, with a person who's, if you're extroverted, who's an introvert or also with another extrovert and so on and so forth. And again, intimacy, you know, what can somebody, 
reveal around their their power that they bring into the relationship their passion around it and how committed can they be to to find ways to to deal with with potential power struggles mm -hmm. as a third level right mm -hmm. as a fourth level uh, we would talk about the heart which is feelings and emotion so how emotionally available is a is a new age term right and very often you can kind of determine that a little bit of, of how many words does somebody have available uh, to how they feel. So some mm -hmm. people, they their language is basically good and bad and hungry and tired, right? <laughs> and, and hungry and tired are not really feelings. <laughs> or, you know, they their sentences usually go, I feel like running out of the room or I feel like this or that, right? So they, they, they often don't even express authentic feelings. And for some people, that's perfectly fine, right? They, they don't even, you know, some relationships, they're, they're not happening on that feeling level, right? And feelings then are just reduced on, on tired and hungry and, and, you know, more states of being than, than real true feelings. And the English language has about 3,000 words for feelings, there are websites that list all these feelings. And so the typical uh, uh, English speaking person, as I heard, you know, has about 10 feeling words or so available to them. And uh, integral people are, you know, people who are more evolved or developed, they may have a hundred uh, yeah. words available. And of course, that also means that that they, they feel subtleties in their, you know, in their interior world not just angry and happy and, and, and sad, you know, so, like, so the base feelings, but there is more, more subtlety and they enjoy revealing uh, uh, their, their, their inner world, you know, which Brené Brown has this, these things about vulnerability, right? How, how vulnerable can, can you be with your partner and, and can your partner accept your vulnerability? So, so how can we learn the other 2,900 words? Or the other. Well, <laughs> I, I, I personally, and, and from my own experience, and, and also with with uh, other people, I often find that that it helps men to read the words and then connect them somehow to a feeling. So it's sort of like a from the head down into the heart. Uh -huh. And I often found that women. They, they already have the feelings, but they don't know how to label them. So they often go like, uh, I know I, I, I feel sort of like, you know, good or bad or something, but I don't really know how to label it. And then when they look at the words, they say, oh yeah, it's it's this, right? And of course, we're, we're, of course there's facial expression and other expressions, but we humans, specifically males, depend very much on on an oral expression, right? If if the woman kind of says, well, don't you get how I feel? Right? The man just draws oh. a blank, right? <laughs> and so sometimes it helps to, 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 to either connect the word to a feeling or connect the feeling to a word. And I see there are some, some gender difference and in my book or in nonviolent communication or on websites, you know, there is lists of different feelings uh, that, that we can learn. So that, that so, just takes practice and it also takes acceptance. Very often males experience shame when they express vulnerable feelings. And, and very often women, even though they say, I wanna know how the man feels, every therapist knows that in the third session, right? The woman says, I don't know how he feels. He never shares his feelings. And then in the third session, he opens up and shares his feelings and the woman goes, well, not those feelings. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, if, if a woman or a man, you know, can accept and hold space for their partner's authentic feelings without judging, you know, and, and welcoming them, embracing them, then you just have more intimacy on, on the heart level. And again, you can feel passionate about sharing your your interior feelings, and you have make a can make a commitment not to judge or reject your partner for share, sharing his and her feelings. Mm -hmm. right. So you say when we women want that um, men tell us their feelings, we must accept also the negative ones and the ones we didn't expect. 
because we have a certain idea that they should feel the same thing we feel mm -hmm. in the moment and then there comes out something else oops yeah well in my book i give men advice to kind of like test the water and because that has to do with feminine and masculine polarities mm -hmm. so when a man shares real vulnerable feelings that that a woman cannot so like hold and she gets really nervous right that that he doesn't love her or that he cannot protect and provide then she usually if she stays gets pushed into her masculine role and then tries to fix the man to to get him back into his masculinity and of course as soon as the man hears that he feels shame because then you know, he, he became vulnerable and showed his weakness. Mm -hmm. The woman swings into onto her masculine side when he, you know, got over on his feminine side. Mm -hmm. And then, then you get this role reversal, which David Data explains very well, you know, what, what happens. So, so in some cases, it is actually better if a man shares his vulnerable feelings with a therapist or with a male friend instead mm -hmm. of with his partner, if his partner, you know, is not strong enough to to hold these feelings without fixing their partner and not getting into fear right as soon when, as the woman feels she goes into fear she she either has to withdraw or fix their uh, her partner right to to get rid of the fear and that leads to what we call the fear shame dynamic in in relationships which then leads to a downward spiral one thing that i have learned to do when we get into delicate areas is to just tell Heidi, uh, this is just for your information, kind of <laughs> neutralize it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's see, you know, and, and, and do it with the uh, things that are, are silly or, or, or just comical or of little consequence, hmm. just to get it uh, an okay way to approach a subject. Yeah, and, yeah. That, and, and really at this point, I can say anything I want, uh, and she doesn't fall off the chair, or she doesn't chase me out of the house. No. So let's Obviously, Heidi is a very uh, uh, conscious woman, so <laughs> I have you're, you're really, really lucky. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to bring it back to the levels. You said the levels of development, mm -hmm. we were in level we four. To, and mm -hmm. I wanted also to ask you, is this uh, ability to express uh, with words, is it really dependent on levels or is it just uh, yeah th this this ability usually to to really differentiate between many feelings is developed in what we call the the pluralistic or the the green uh, level in in ken wilbur's you know uh, scale of mm -hmm. uh, of developmental stages so that that's where men and women tend to do a lot of introspection for it was not even a question how people felt in a in a marriage. The marriage yeah. was what it was, and yeah. you had a certain role, and you had to fulfill a role. And if yeah. you feel good or bad, it was not really the the, the main question. And mm -hmm. even not to differentiate the feeling in yeah. hundreds mm -hmm. of things. So yeah. it had a different uh, reason why people were yeah. together, and not yeah. for living there emotional life mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you are right Obviously uh, we, we are not yet in green so continue with uh well with level. This might yeah. be for integral people so like a, a green level right where we, we where we differentiate and then also feel comfortable you know it's not that people before green don't have feelings but they don't feel comfortable to to express them because mm -hmm. they're always told don't bring feelings into this conversation right be rational or you know don't yeah. don't express your anger and things like that we're 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 very trained specifically young boys but also increasingly women right not to authentically express their feelings and in in in, in the green stage we're conscious and liberated enough in a way that that we realize how important it is to to express our feelings and to share them with our partner mm -hmm. then then the next level is is our our level of, of self-expression and and again of course we're all expressing ourselves in some ways but but this is usually not very authentic so so when when we ask people you know what who are you truly in your essence or what is your authentic purpose in life they, they often cannot express that in a 
you know, in a real grounded and 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 confident way, right? Mm -hmm. they, they usually didn't say, well, I'm a doctor, I'm a teacher, and I do this and this and this. But when you ask why, it's usually it just happened that way, or it was somehow, you know, uh, uh, imposed on them from from the outside or even self-imposed. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I just asked my daughter, why did you become a doctor? And I said, well, I was the best in school. And so when you're the best in school, you become a doctor, right? That's just the most, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and and I mean, she's happily becoming a doctor, but she's now somewhere starting to, to question why did she make that choice? You know, and it was just like, just that's what you do when you're the best in school. And sure. uh, and so that that's where I see, you know, this, this kind of self, uh, in, in, self-expression and then of course finding ways to liberate yourself from uh, from these socially and culturally imposed or by family or where, what, wherever it came from from religious uh, you know what what you should do what you have to do and 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 find a deeper uh, uh, purpose and then not only verbally express that but but of course express it in 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 all your walks of life <laughs> And is it that stage when people begin to prefer to be single than take over the role of a husband or a wife in the old uh, ways? Yeah, I mean that that can be very often the case. That that uh, that in this very often, of course, you know, uh, men do certain things to attract you know the, the the most attractive physically attractive women that they can get and women very often are attracted to men with status and wealth and they define their own worth or their being or their identity by the kind of partner they have attracted or they can attract and once somebody realizes that they are not defined by how good the woman looks on his arm and how successful and powerful the man is on on her arm then of course the question is who am i and and very often to find out who am i truly or more authentically at least you know uh, it often takes that we do that outside the context of a relationship yeah and what a journey that can be mm -hmm. yeah and the door of that old identity and, and just investigate yeah. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily mean that couples have to split up to 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 experience that, but but uh, very often they do because they they kind of see that as somewhat of an end game to no longer needing a partner. But if we bring a lot of awareness and consciousness into that process and give each other enough freedom to to go through that process, then you know there is a good chance that it actually deepens. Uh, the intimacy be between partners. But if only one of them, which is often the case, goes on that journey and the other says, well, everything is fine and I'm just happy with, with the way things are, then obviously that becomes a problem. It's happened to yeah. me several times. <laughs> what do women want anyway? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sir. Yeah, so what you're saying, what I'm hearing is, when, for instance, somebody is really connected to, I want to have a man of status, you know, and earns mm -hmm. a lot of money. And then the man, I'm talking from the perspective BMW. of a woman. BMW. BMW, yeah. I was very attracted to my first husband because he drove a BMW. And yeah. I was happy. But that's not what I wanted to say. And then uh, you, the, the, the man decides that he just leaves the job because he wants to do something else. He wants to be a Buddhist monk or something. Mm -hmm. And yeah. all of a sudden, there is no status anymore, no money anymore. Uh, so this is a challenge for a woman. And, and the other way around, mm -hmm. there are similar challenges. Do you think these can be overcome? And if yes, how? If not, how not? <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Oh, Mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of like, you know, we, we're back at where the conversation started, right? If, if if your attraction is purely based on your primary fantasy, then of course, when, when the woman gets maybe older, as Einstein said, men marry women and hope they stay the same, and women marry men and hope they change, and inevitably both are unhappy, right? So So if that is the basis of the relationship, of course, then you know as we as we get older that that goes away but i think that the, the deeper question is really how do the 
do, how do we define our self-worth, right? Or our identity. And, and I think a lot of people define their self-worth based on the, 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 the quality, let's say, or, or the status, right, of, of the partner they can attract. So if a man has a 20-year, you know, that a 50-year-old man has a 20-year younger woman who is, who, who is very physically attractive, you know, there, there, there is more um, uh, testosterone released in him and he just like feels very good. But, but then he, he also defines himself by look, you know, what kind of guy I am because I can attract this woman. And with, if a woman is with a, with a high status man, right, with big income or big power or whatever, and she defines herself through that, then that's of course not her authentic self or unique mm -hmm. self, depending on where you fall in the debate between authentic or unique self, right? And, and that is the problem. It's not that, that that this goes away in a way, because then you can also then always say, well, I just need to find another person who gives me back that, that identity that I can attract a young woman or a powerful man. But at one point people realize this is not who I am. I'm not defined by, I, I just used the word quality, right, or of my partner, but, but you know, I'm defined by living my authentic uh, purpose or, or, or discovering my unique self. And then we're less prone to be so dependent on, on this value, uh, uh, valuation to, to a partner. And this again, happens looking, looking at stages, of course, that this kind of insight only happens at higher uh, stages of development or consciousness. That's what I was going to say. That needs at least a green level of development to understand yeah. that. Uh, or even uh, an integral level, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, sure. <laughs> what I was going to say when you said the 50-year-old man attracts a 20-year-old woman, what actually years. happens is the man uh, looks for being, you know, as you said, something special, and the woman looks for a father mm -hmm. and not yeah, for yeah. a partner. So <laughs> I had that in my life too once. Yes. So I, I, I said, it's not true, it's not true. But afterwards, mm -hmm. I understood it was really bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we want to have somebody who is taking yeah. care for us and finally mm -hmm. gives us the love of a father, yeah. which mm -hmm. we didn't have in, in childhood. And mm -hmm. Even if we believe it's not so, it is so. And the men probably want to avoid to be older, want to avoid to, to, to grow up. Because with a young person, they can pretend to be still young. They don't really have to mature. Because when you think 30 years of difference, it's such a different life experience. You cannot be peers. <laughs> Just not. Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't know yeah. what you're saying for that. Yeah. And as I, you know, heard you speak, you know, I, I, I also remembered to bring up the topic of transcend and include. So, so obviously, as we go up this ladder, if you want to use that uh, metaphor, you know, we're, we're not transcending these earlier levels. We still have a lifestyle. We still have a sexuality. We mm -hmm. still have our power. You know, that that both partners bring to the relationship. We still have our feelings and so on and so forth and but but the higher we grow the more we have an opportunity to express the earlier stages in, in a more healthy way so it's not that they go away but they get transformed into more healthy sustainable uh, expressions yeah um, for instance we are not uh, anymore expressing the anger and what we have in a destructive way on the uh, other partner no yeah. <laughs> i remember him sometimes and at the beginning, mm -hmm. he exploded in some anger, and then oh, yeah. I really could see he was working on it and said, okay, this is mine, has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. So we can take responsibility. We can learn to take responsibility for our own emotions, and we can become emotionally literate, mm -hmm. you know. So this is, I think, a very, very big thing to, to create healthy relationships mm -hmm. that we, every one of us, independently, grow our emotional knowledge of no, our knowledge of our emotions. And as yeah. you say, the more we can name them, the more we can discern them. And what we need to learn mm -hmm. also that our emotions is never because it's their fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's our emotions, oh. not their emotions, right. when we feel them. Mm -hmm. 
It's when we push buttons that we have not installed, right? As we say. <laughs> so. And then as the final stage, you know, we can kind of put this together is, is a relationship as a spiritual practice, you know, which for ego transcendence mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, becoming present in the moment, not so much living in pain in the past and fear of the future. Uh, and uh, it's, it's of course always this question, you know, can you awaken on your own? But uh, I think Eckhart Tolle really nailed it when when he wrote in in the Power of Now, three failed relationships in in as many years will bring you closer to enlightenment or awakening than sitting, you know, on a des desert island uh, by yourself. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. And and as most people know who who think they're so spiritual, when they then enter a relate in a relationship, this is really where the rubber hits the road. Road. Uh, I also like to quote Adya Shanti there, who, who, you know, is a spiritual teacher, but once with his wife decided to do a, so, like a couples retreat. And as far as I know, he only did it once because all these people who were, you know, his uh, that came who were quite spiritually involved, he realized how many problems they have in their relationship, and they said, "I'm not a therapist," and they they actually need therapy, not you know, spiritual uh, advancement in a way to make their relationships work. So, but, but of course it's a pointer and it allows us to deepen our spiritual practice. And then along with that, really develop uh, an, 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 a higher authentic purpose, you know, as, as fears and things drop away that we can then potentially share uh, together with our partner as you too so beautifully do. Oh, thank you. You know, this, uh, what you said uh, on the last stage, this is exactly why we have planned this series of relationships. First, intimate relationships and later relationships at work or also uh, on uh, social media or inside the um, organizations. Because, you know, relationships is everything. And the higher we go, the more we can inspire people not just accept that the relationship is as it always was and yeah. we have to uh, it goes like this mm -hmm. that there is a possibility to grow up mm -hmm. to grow up everyone by themselves this is very much needed but then to grow up together yeah. and we can we mm -hmm. can help each other to grow up mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is so, 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 so important that we do that because when we are, have a mature relationship, we have, I want to say a peaceful relationship, doesn't mean that we don't quarrel, but yeah. we always find back to, to, to peace. And for me, the, the endeavor of these broadcasts we are doing from the Wisdom Factory, and I know mm -hmm. it's also for you, is in some way help to create peace on earth. And our idea is that when you create mm -hmm. peace in your relationship, maybe yeah. first in yourself, then in your relationship, <laughs> then you can contribute to create peace on earth. Why, when you are angry all the time and emotionally, you cannot handle your emotions, how can you expect that uh, yeah. countries, people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, do that. Yeah, when, I, when I first met you, you know, I certainly understood the importance of us being very open and honest with each other. And uh, but but what about taking care of the world? I don't care about that, you know. <laughs> and that has been more slow in coming. And mm. uh, and <clears throat> the, and and as I realized, as I moved up a notch that I was also able to go down a notch mm -hmm. and acknowledge parts of me that were still there, still very active, but that I did not want to deal with, I did not want to examine, I did not want to integrate them into mm -hmm. my total uh, personality, who I was. I didn't allow him that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we are sort of closing. We have uh, we are over time, but we started very late. Unfortunately, I excuse uh, myself ex again. I tried my best to make it work. Anyway, <laughs> don't excuse yourself. <laughs> no, I don't know what what Things you're saying. This case. Yeah. Shit, happens. Shit happens, and we called our series "Stop the Relationship" and yeah. also the technic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, before we go over to Blab, where everybody can join, you need a Twitter account and. The link is, I will post it again, and is also in the 
webinar jam chat and is also on the event page on Google. Uh, I would like to, to bring it back a little bit on falling in love and the mixed mistakes you uh, can avoid. You have, we have now taken all around. Can you get it in a nutshell, in two sentences? <laughs> well, if, if, you, if you experience this hormonal love, of course, you know, that's a real gift. And I'm, I'm not saying, you know, run towards it or run away, but, you know, have, have some, ask some good questions and have some, some good conversation uh, before you spend, you know, go down so like a, a dead end road where in the end you, you may get hurt. And uh, that's, that's basically all I, I can say. Okay. And see, you know, talking about the levels, you know, to, to what level can your partner uh, connect with you? Is it only on the material? Is the sexual? Is it an exchange like you provide the material, he or she provides the sexual, so it's not mutual, right? Do you contribute at, at each level somewhat equally? Or is it an, an, an uneven exchange that, that that things are traded, right? Money for sex or uh, sex for power. And, and or, you know, is a woman maybe helping a man like with his emotions who's, who's emotionally starved and things like that. So, so we're looking for more for equality at all these levels. And, and if you want to have a certain con, let's say you want to talk about your feelings and your partner that you just, or the person you just get to know says, well, I don't want to talk about feelings and, and, you know, it's better not to have feelings. Then obviously if that's important to you, know that that will become an issue over time, no matter how much you, you feel you, you are infatuated. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like my idea is, is not to run away from infatuation and, and, and the feelings of falling in love, but then be very clear about what the purpose of this relationship is and say, okay, we're infatuated. Maybe the sex is great, but let's not buy a house together, right? Maybe let's not have children right away if you're young enough, right? And then after a year, it turns in, into a disaster. That's, yeah, that's I, all, like my idea to be realistic about what is the purpose of our relationship. Mm -hmm. yes. I would even start further out of my experience. And I know for women, sexuality, even if they pretend to be like men and try out everything, I'd had this period too. But for women, sexuality has a different meaning than for men. And when we go too early into sexuality, then all sorts of things appear. And in my um in my experience, it was that then I cannot easily go away anymore. It mm. is much more difficult. Yeah. So, you know, so I had sort of to fall in love because I was sexually involved with the person. So uh, this is, I, I would give the, the recommendation to women to wait a little while and first mm. talk and do nice things and so on. But, but wait a little while because then when it goes on the sexual game, who knows where we end up and first get to know the other person. I, mm. I would say so, although I did sometimes really not that, but it's just my. <laughs> well, I don't want you to change your mind if we wait, you know, no, no, no. anyway. So and, and I don't want to suggest that it's sort of like a romantic relationship turns into a job interview. No, <laughs> that's not. But, but there are skillful ways. There are skillful ways and, and good questions to ask, right? Where, yeah. where if you look at through an uh, integral lens, you can fairly quickly find out, you know, where a person is on these uh, six levels in these three areas, intimacy, passion, and commitment that we discussed. And, and six times three, you already have 18 parameters, right? Mm -hmm. To, to, to sort of like get to know a person, you know, in, in a very authentic, natural way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Martin, you are offering uh, workshops and things and also your book. Where can people find that? Uh, my website, integralrelationship.com. Ah. Integralrelationship.com. Okay. Very okay. simple. Mm -hmm. And then and, they can subscribe for your newsletter and where, where all... You can the, order the book. We have upcoming workshops in Frankfurt and Munich and, and England in April and then also in the US. And yeah, there's a lot of information there. Okay. There's a blog and so on and so forth. 
So thank you very, very, very much oh, that have great. endured mm -hmm. with us the initial difficulties. Mm -hmm. And that was a great, great, great talk. Mm -hmm. And we invite people to come over now in a few minutes into Blab. You'll find the link in the comments and also on the event page. And otherwise, my Twitter handle where you can look for my profile is at Traviata. 56. Traviata is the heroine La Traviata of a Verdi opera. It expresses my identity as an opera singer. So, at Traviata with a big T and 56 at the end. You find me there on blab.im. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. We'll see you Not soon. me alone. We will be all there. And yep. you can ask your questions live and on camera. Okay. Yep. See you. Bye bye. Okay. And thank you. So long. Bye bye.